Welcome to Talking Story. Christopher Rocchio, I am beyond excited that you have joined us. I have only read the first book in your series, but I know you saw my review. I had to set it down a couple times and let the wheels spin. I had, I had to go get a snack to grease up those wheels. There's so much going on thematically, philosophically, and I just, I could not wait to talk to you. So I couldn't wait to get any more books under my belt. I wanted to have you on as quickly as possible. So thank you so much for joining us, Ben. Yeah, gosh. Well, thanks for having me, and uh, and thanks for the review. It was, uh, yeah, it was it was fun to watch. Cool. Uh, uh, I, I'm you were so very happy. So, well, I'm so happy you enjoyed. It. I meant every word of it. Um, let me just kind of start. I always like to start uh, these conversations. Of it, it's kind of like a calling when you start your artistic journey. When you decide, you know, I want to be a storyteller. This is what I'm going to do. Do you remember that moment that it hit you that that this was it for you? Uh, so, so no, because it was really, it was really early. I, um, I've been writing in some form or other, uh, and, and with the intention of being serious about it since I was about eight, I think I was in maybe, wow. may, maybe second grade. Uh, You're kidding I had, me. No, no. I had no idea how it worked. Uh, I just like, I knew like vaguely how writing worked cause I'd read books. I, um, I was reading really early. I, uh, I think Harry Potter, the first one came out when I was when I was four and I didn't make it through it uh, all the way by myself. You know, my, my, my parents helped me a little bit, but I was reading it by myself at uh, four. By, yes. Yeah. Uh, and by the time the third one came out, I was in, I was in first grade. I think it was, and I did read that one by myself. So I was reading really early and I, I, uh, I really, I like, I've always liked books. Um, and then my parents got me, I, I tried to read Lord of the Rings cause the movies were coming out around then. And I, it seemed in my, head like that was like the logical like next thing like you know between harry potter books was to like get onto this new thing and those are much harder to read oh uh, yeah you know especially uh, at that age sure yeah so i would have been uh like eight or nine i think when the first movie was coming out and that was i, I had my first copies were the the mass market film tie-ins and yeah, um, yeah, yeah so i i couldn't get through them my parents got me uh, they thought they got me the audiobooks. They got me the BBC radio drama productions. And I'm like, these don't seem like books. Uh, I thought like someone was just going to read to me. And then I figured out what unabridged meant. And I uh, was deeply scandalized. And I was like, we have to find the right ones. Uh, so I had the Robert English recordings on CD. So that was how I read Lord of the Rings. Um, oh. But that left a, left a really big uh, imprint uh, on me. And I'm like, this is what I want to do. I want to be like Tolkien. So uh, that... Yeah. That's the first moment you remember having that cognizant thought of when you were listening to those CDs in you were going to Middle Earth and you had that you had that thought. Yeah, I don't remember a like singular instant. I just remember like the general impression kind of emerging from because they're the only audiobooks I owned. You know, this was like way before mm -hmm. Audible. Right. So I had them on the CD. And if I wanted to get more audiobooks, I would go to the library and check them out. And my dad would rip the MP3s. Uh, nice. you know, the libraries had not, uh, had not thought of a way around this at the time. I'm not sure if they have at this point, but, um, but, uh, but I would, I would do that. So I, I got a few other audio books because I had so few, I just listened to Lord of the Rings incessantly and somewhere in the process of listening to Lord of the Rings over and over and over again, I was like, this is, this is what I want to do. Um, and at the same time I was like, <laughs> this is really silly, but I was, uh, I was playing, I was playing make believe right at recess with my friends. I was like five, six, seven. Right. And, uh, you know, it started out like, you know, I was Batman or like I was Luke Skywalker or whatever. Right. And uh, and they were whatever character they wanted to be. And we were just, you know, roughhousing. Right. Uh, and eventually that got more complicated and everybody sort of like started making their own characters. But they all quit. They like develop social skills and started playing sports and stuff. Yeah. And I I just sat yeah. on the corner of the field with a notebook, you know, doodling. And um, I never really stopped whatever that project was, just turned into an actual uh, project as I got older. Um, and I, I finished uh, a manuscript, I think around like eighth grade. It's terrible. There's only one printed copy of it that's left. Like if you read one sentence at a time, you'll think this is OK. Uh, but like as a P, uh, collection, it just it's it's a nightmare. But I finished yeah. it, which was which was which was something. I mean, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah. It was it was probably a novella. Honestly, I don't I don't know how long it really is. But um, I haven't looked at it in a long time. I'm afraid to. It's. You know, it's, it's, it's that cabinet you look at. You can like hear the yeah. white noise intensifying. But you, you you know it's there. You can feel it. Yeah, exactly. It yeah. starts. It starts like everything starts to shake and it gets a little darker. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, but uh, I, I did finish it, and I, I remember. I think Aragon came out when I was in maybe fifth grade, 
and uh, I was like, oh, this guy is like 18. That's like only a little older than like 11. I can I can do this then. I thought I had to be like 80. Uh, you know, because the picture of Tolkien, you know, is you know he's in his seventies. Oh, I think it, he's in, yeah, he's up there. Yeah, on, yeah, it's not like a young Tolkien picture on uh, on the books, right? Uh, and so I had always, you know, I had to be old, but you didn't. It turns out you don't have to be. So uh, I went to college. I got an English degree because I hate money, and um, <laughs> and uh, um, I, I like really because I got a rhetoric degree, which was uh, oh like, my god! It's a, wait, it gets worse. I thought you know yeah. the. I, there's only there's one below rhetoric, and I think that's El- Elizabethan poetry. Like I think, yeah, which seriously. which man, I, I took a lot of classes. I took every Shakespeare class they they had, uh, uh, just because Shakespeare is Shakespeare. Uh, I, sure, I but uh, yeah, but it was a complete. You know, it was almost a complete waste of money, except that I got an internship with uh, Bain Books my last year, um, and they're like the only uh, sort of uh, they're the only like New York publisher that's uh, that's in. Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> so I, uh, I sort of backed into uh, a job in the publishing industry through an education program <laughs> and wow. uh, to, to get a job with them. Um, they are my publisher now. They weren't at the time because I didn't want to be the guy who uh, was like, you know, the unpaid intern trying to get people to read his book, you know. Uh, so I didn't mention it. I just uh, borrowed their contact information for agents and got an agent the old fashioned way. And uh, I just saved a little Googling by getting their directory. Uh, yeah, you know, running a copy off the office. So let, and, let me. Other than other than Tolkien, can you remember other influences that were really like super important to you in your formative years? Which yeah, I guess was four to eight. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the formative period like never really stops, right? If you, yeah, if you're if right. You, you're right. If you keep going, right? And um, the 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 next big one was was Frank Herbert, and I think it's really obvious reading the book, uh, and it was supposed to be, you know, that you know, uh, but I. Uh, I read Dune. I think, I think maybe eighth grade. Uh, I had a, I, I have a friend. Uh, we haven't spoken in uh, a couple of years now. Just he's busy. Uh, who was always uh, he? He's like he's like a professor at Princeton now, right? Uh, so he, you know, he, he. I was always trying to keep up with him, and so he would, you know, be in sixth grade. And he's like Christopher. Like I'm reading this, you know, this this Chinese history book, and I'm like, oh, I should read that too, right? And and uh, he was telling me about Dune. Which turned out he then went on to never read. Uh, he just like <laughs> he was he was like yeah. Uh, um, or if he if he has read it since it wasn't at the time. Uh, I he was like I you know uh, I think it was a big uh, I think he saw the David Lynch film and thought it was cool. Yeah. And, uh, and David Lynch film was cool. I think it's cool too. It's like not Dune in a lot of ways. No, but I it, have it, a, it, it, Dune is so hard to do. I mean, it's so hard to do. Yeah, all, all three adaptations are lacking in their own ways. Uh, I, I, you know, I, uh, I like, I like the Villeneuve one, but I, I could still, I could still complain about it. You know, uh, yeah, you know, someone if someone put a gun to my head. Uh, but, uh, but I got real into that, and uh, then I went into, uh, I went to a magnet school uh, in uh, in ninth grade, and they had a, a science fiction literature elective course that you could oh, take. Oh wow, which was awesome. really really cool. That was uh, that was nice. It was taught by. Uh, uh, guy, Mr. Goheen, who was, uh, is sort of an old school capital F fan, like Worldcon attendee kind of fan. I don't know if you've ever like met the archetype, but he had, he had the look, right. He had the glasses with the double bar and the, like you were yes. a hippie in the sixties and, you know, uh, the vest and all that. Right. And he was a great, great teacher. But, uh, that class was, uh, it was a whole year, I think. And, uh, and we read, uh, we read, you know, the the big three. We read Asma, we read Clark, we read Heinlein. Uh, we read some earlier stuff. Uh, we read a lot of short stories, and then we like went through the new wave. We went through uh, cyberpunk in the '80s and like the humanist movement in the '90s and stuff like that. And I think that was about when the when the when the class ended. Um, so I I have like a weird thing where I'm like kind of a weird like a generation out of phase in terms of the books I've read. Like when I I talk to other science fiction fans that are sort of. Uh, sort of my age, like I, like I haven't read a lot of the same stuff and it's cause I was getting this education, uh, you know, from this older guy. So I, I, I'm like more familiar with Van Vogt than I am with like, I don't know, uh, Peter Hamilton or something. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that's even two generations, but, um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, which, which is, which is paid big dividends for you. Yeah. I think it yeah. paid major dividends for you. No, thanks. I, I, I like I like the older stuff, uh, you know, earlier in a in an art forms history, the the fences aren't as uh, overgrown. 
uh, you know, uh, it, they, or, or they're not even built yet. And there's a lot more room for experimentation. You know, at least think of Lovecraft as a fantasy writer, right? Uh, back in the right. day. And they, yeah. do, and they don't anymore because everyone's drawn these like very cute, annoying little boxes around everything. And, you know, it's like, oh, uh, I see you've got too much peanut butter in this chocolate. And I, I much uh, prefer not doing that. So, um, oh, man, you, you're, you're going to have me break my soapbox out, dude, because so many times on the channel, I start railing against the shelf Nazis about why is this book over here when it should, you know, it, it it's this is. Just because you think this is highbrow, you don't you put it, it should, it's science fiction. It should be over here. You know, like it, it, it drives me crazy. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. I, there's this sort of weird, like, uh, I, I think it's like a gamer thing, honestly, because like everybody needs all the enemies and characters to have classes and, you know, uh, types and things. Everything goes in its own little box so that you know where to put it on the table. Um, I don't, um, I don't, I don't, I've never, I've never gotten that. So I, uh, I liked, I liked a lot of those older writers because the, the fences are a lot less distinct, right? Uh, you know, like the, my favorite Conan yeah. story is Tower of the Elephant, right? And there's an alien in it, right? Uh, you would not expect an alien in a Conan story, but like the maybe the most famous Conan story is about an alien. Um, so, you know, those expectations uh, being removed or not existing yet in those earlier stories is something I always really enjoyed. So. Uh, that was a sort of a big influence on me, that that class. And I think from there, like, basically the pattern was set. Um, there's, like, other stuff, too. Like, I was a big, uh, I am a big video game guy. Uh, a lot of, like, Japanese RPG influence uh, over there, you know. Um, uh, watched a lot of anime growing up because I was the right age for Toonami to be the coolest thing ever. Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, so. So you, know. you touched on it a little bit. What was it like to go through the publishing process at what, how, okay. How, when you had a finished manuscript of empire of silence, like you were what age? Uh, so, uh, the one that I sold was finished when I was finished when I was 21 sold when I was 22, I think. Yeah. Um, and you started writing it when you were, uh, started writing something you would recognize as that draft at like 18. Um, wow. there are, there are parts of empire of silence that were written when I was 18, the Delos stuff is substantially older than the Emesh stuff. Because after I sold it, my editor, or actually before I sold it, my editor was like, look, uh, I really, I, I love the book, think it's amazing. You know, I read the whole thing overnight and I'm making you the offer the next day. Uh, but I want you to think about changing a couple things. Uh, and these were like, if you say no to any of this, like we're not gonna sign you, right? Yeah. Uh, so they yeah. went through, they went through the list. Uh, and I was like, oh, and of course I was like, sure, like I can work with that. And there were a couple of them. I won't like say what they were, but there were a couple of them like, man, that like makes me uncomfortable. I don't like that change. But if I just like say yes, right, I can edit the book, you know, um, and the book was at the time like half as long. And I like in my heart, I wanted to write this, you know, giant book. Right. And and they yeah, don't yeah. like to buy giant books from untested authors. Um, right. I mean, your first they're... book shouldn't be massive. You know, they don't like that. <laughs> Right, they don't. It's 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 a much harder economic proposition to to put out a quarter million word book than it is to put out a hundred thousand word book because you can you have to print fewer because they're more expensive and the bookstores will order fewer of them because Barnes and Noble you know worries about its inventory space by the inch right? right so if your book is two inches they're going to order one they might order two if it's like three quarters of an inch they might order six and you can get to three times the number of customers right and and they yeah. won't. You know, it'll be cheaper, you know, but it won't be like half as much for half the amount of book, right? It'll be like the difference between a $20 book and a $24 book or whatever, right? So, uh, but I saw my opportunity and and Daw was uh, was very insistent on the, we published Tad Williams, uh, the book can be as long as you need it to be now that you're in kind of talking point, which was great. So I was like, look, I can just sort of, like those things that I'm not sure about, like I can find a compromise, right? That will satisfy all parties. And I can put way more stuff into the book that I wanted to put in the book. So I did that. Um, and so the the Emesh stuff is all um, is all significantly, I think it's about, yeah, it's it's like three to, it's like three or four years newer than, than some of the Delos stuff is. Um, so it, it went through a pretty heavy revision cycle. None of the books really have been revised as heavily since. Uh, there's a whole thing where the fourth book got split into books four and five, but that was that's a different kind of work, right? And that happened a lot faster mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't um wasn't so much rewriting as it was adding stuff. Uh, sorry, my answers get away from me sometimes. 
Yeah, no, 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 go, go. Uh, uh, but, so what was that like? So you started at 18, <laughs> you get an internship, you you get a you get a list of agents, you're out there like at 20, 21, 22, like what was that like to go through the publishing process at that age? I mean, it, you know, you didn't have Professor Tolkien in a thirst trap picture. You didn't, I mean, you know, you you started to realize that later in life you could be this young. What was it like to actually go through that? That just sounds wild to me. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty wild. I'm, um, but I'm, I'm always sort of like low affect anyway. So, you know, I was like, I was pretty excited, but excited on me usually looks like, you know, and like, that's it, right? There's no jumping or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, I also got deflated because the day I made the sale, uh, we had to go, I immediately had to go to a dinner with my entire family to celebrate my brother's engagement. So I had to shut up, uh, and like not, and not make, say anything and not say, yeah, and not say anything. Uh, so I sat through the whole dinner, uh, and then we went to the restaurant I was working at at the time. So I went and told my friends in the back, I was like, I just sold the book. Right. And uh, my yeah. parents were like, you keep getting up to go to the bathroom a lot. Like, and I'm like, I'll tell you, after I, dinner. It's fine. yeah, I got a uh, bladder infection. Let, let it go. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, you know, like, aren't you going to like be here? Like your brother, you know? Uh, and, um, and, uh, so we got outside and I was like, okay, this is what's going on. And you know, then they were excited, but, um, but, uh, but no, so like the, the thing is, is I um I graduated December uh 2015 uh, <laughs> uh the day before Star Wars got substantially worse uh as it happens and then uh, that's a whole other thing I just I remember that so distinctly I was so excited uh, and then less um but uh, but then about a month later I'd sold the book um so it was wow. just a couple of weeks so we just got through Christmas and New Year's and then it was it was mid January. But it was the same week I actually got the job. I'd been an intern for the previous year. And uh, I had like pretty good sense that one or two of the employees wasn't going to stick around much longer. So I, I, I stuck it out. And uh, sure enough, they were, they were like, hey, uh, do, you want, you know, do you want their job? And I was like, absolutely, sure, let's do it. Um, but I didn't tell them that I had these like, you know, a publication offers sort of circulating uh, until uh, after the, the the job was sort of closed because I ended up published by a competitor. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, look, this is, uh, this is what's going on. And like, they, like Bain was always very cool about it. Uh, and it was, it was useful to sort of to have like the two, the two separate lives that way, nobody's bothering me at work about work. Right. Um, and, um, and I ended up working for them for the next six years, done a year already as an intern. And uh, I quit uh, almost, I think almost two years ago now. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, I'm really bad at remembering like timelines in my own life. Uh, real history, fine. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but my life, no, I have no idea. Uh, I think it was two years ago, uh, and I've been I've been writing full time ever since. So wow, um, yeah, wow. Okay, I I let me. I want to get into a little bit of the book, and I got I marked a passage because I'm I love Dune too, man. Like it's it's my it's my number one. But I do think I think you do something a little bit better, and and. And it's just, oh, it just might be because of my background and, you know, when you approach, you approach a piece of art, you bring yourself and, you know, all that kind of subjective stuff. But there, I want to get into what I think you do. And I, I can't believe I'm saying it. maybe and I've only read one book in the series, but possibly even better than Herbert. And that is world building through who we are as a culture, a species of people through our stories. And I just, I want to, I want to start it off by reading this little section to you here and I'm sure, I'm sure you'll recognize it. Um, the artist sees things not in terms of what is or what might be, but in terms of what must be of what our world must become. This is why a portrait will to the human observer always defeat the photograph. It is why we turn to religion, even when science objects and why the least Scoliest might outperform a machine. The photograph captures creation as it is. It captures fact. Facts bore me in my old age. It is the truth that interests me. And the truth is in charcoal or in the vermilion by whose properties I record this account, not in data or laser light. Truth lies not in rote, but in the small and subtle imperfections, the mistakes that define art and humanity both. First of all, Wow. <laughs> like yeah, you were, thanks. you were I somewhere between 18 and 21 when you jotted that down. 
And just like that is that is just jaw dropping on so many levels. But what that sets up for me and what you go on to keep coming back to over and over in this first book, and I can only assume through the whole series as well, is this amazing world building that not, I mean, let's just start with setting. You start off by a very Greco-Roman aesthetic. And I, I have my theories of why that would be, but what, I mean, what, what were the aspects of that? And let me just throw mine out there. I think we, it's such a touchstone for us of civilization that we're all able to completely somehow in some kind of gestalt, remember grab onto, understand the cradle of drama and humanity where we sprung from a storytelling in a large sense. And I think that is why you chose it. And that spoke to me so amazingly through this book. So what what were your thoughts? Yeah, no, that, that, that was that was basically it. So I, I, you know, I was telling you before we were recording, right, I have a rhetoric background, uh, which has a bit of an overlap with the classics anyway. But I, I, I took Latin uh, in college because I am really bad actually at acquiring languages. And so Latin, they don't expect you to speak, uh, in class, right. You know, um, you know, you don't have to have a conversation, you know, like, Oh, quit August. Like, no, it doesn't happen. Right. Uh, and so since that was all written down, I sort of backed into a, a classics minor as a, as a consequence of this. So I just started taking, you know, uh, all the Greek theater courses they could take. And so I just sort of like became a, a like classics weeb, I guess. Yeah. Uh, as a, as a sort of consequence of the, the courses I was taking, not that I wasn't always, you know, I always, uh, was attracted to that period in history. I, uh, um, I'm a Catholic. I went to Catholic school and, uh, you do a, a lot of sort of, uh, you know, uh, work on that period in history of course that's when christ lived right and uh and contrary to i think a lot of people's uh imagination right there's a lot of like history education that like comes along with that so i was like uh going through catholic school uh up through up until high school uh and so we were always you know in that part of the world you know uh you know learning about that period and about you know not just you know uh christ and the apostles and like all of that stuff right but the emperors and the context of this is all taking place because it's all very important uh right. you know to that sociopolitically and, yeah right right and and, and uh you know and, and, and it informs it you know informs a lot of it, it, it is from this you know that melange right that we get the entire world that we, that we live in right it's this it's it's that clash of sort of you know uh sort of roman uh like jurisprudence and and culture with the sort of uh you know the the the, the jewish christian world right and and the greek stuff that you know is the interface between the two but like that is our civilization right obviously you know there's more complicating factors to it but that is the that's sort of the base code and because of this like you said right that stuff reads old right to everyone right. and and you right want, i wanted the world to feel lived in and this is like this is not a new trick but i i came around to it on my own and then read book of the new sun uh <laughs> as i was revising the first book and literally there's a translator's note in the back that says uh i'm translating this from future speak uh all these Greek and Latin words because I wanted to feel old. And it's like, Gene, you, you beat me to it. Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, usually when I find a writer has beaten me to something or a movie has, I just do it anyway, because it's, well, you know, I, look, I mean, there, you, you can't let that stand in your way. I mean, you know, you, you, uh, you can't, and you can't let it ruin the setup that you've done. No, either, no. Right? I, I, um, I look, I, I've said for you, it's like, you know, it, 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 that, Hey, clockwork, orange, Oryx and Crake. I mean, there's all I could throw many examples of, you know, language becoming future speak and that kind of thing, you know, um, but you can't let that stand in your way by putting your spin on it. And what I love so much about the spin that you put on it, Christopher, is there's such an intense importance in the story that has made us up running through this book. There's there's I mean, we're talking about. um little pieces and shout outs to, to, to Christopher Marlowe, William Shakespeare, Rudyard Kipling, George Orwell, many, many more, right. As I'm reading through that, these things are hitting us. And it's like, we, we, this, this culture feels real and lived in because it is us. It's so far removed from us. Some of these things have become amalgamated or bastardized these stories, but it's yeah. still, it, <laughs> it feels, it feels like us. Yeah, so this was actually I'm really like I'm really glad that 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 worked for you because uh if I get one consistent thread of criticism, it's from the people who've like only read Dune and they're like missing all this other stuff. So they're not getting the Dune connections in context either. 
Uh, and they're just like, wow, this guy like really liked Dune, I guess. Like, no, uh, I like Dune and. Uh, and you know, there's and, so much storytelling in this. And and not only storytelling, but history as well. And it, my thing is like, I, I see for me, Dune, it, I love Dune. And so I, it's my it's my number one series, like I say, but it doesn't have this element to it. We we as the Empire writ large forward over these thousands of years feel vastly different to me than the society I'm living in now. Right. It, 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 and that was, I'm sure, conscious on, on her. You part, overcame I, that. You I overcame find, that. I always found that deeply unbelievable. The extent of the connective tissue between Paul's time in Dune and ours is a couple seashells in Dune Messiah, a, uh, a, a, a Van Gogh painting, I think, in book six. And like, I'm literally Hitler, by the way, uh, in uh, in book two. And right. like, that's, you know, I, I think there are a couple others, right? I think I think the God Emperor references Bach at one point and a couple other things, but it's, it's so thin on the ground. Uh, um, that's not actually how humanity remembers its past at all. No. Right now, right. like there's sort of an inverse relationship to like how much we have of a culture and how strongly we remember it. Like, I, I, w I don't know necessarily that most people know who Gilgamesh is, but your odds of encountering someone who does and is at least vaguely uh, conversant with that story is is pretty good. Like you can you can go into a room of thirty people and probably somebody knows who Gilgamesh is and can probably tell you about Enkidu a little bit, right? They might yeah. not know the whole plot, but like maybe they've at least played Civilization, right? And you know, sure, uh, they've got something because there's this weird tendency. Not, if, if not Gilgamesh, they would know Beowulf or they, Odysseus or you know, some. Yeah, some everybody's heard of Achilles, right? Yeah, yeah like, something like, would be absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I think we lost him. I think he locked up there. There we go. Oh, there There's you are. There's this weird okay. tendency of things that have. We good? Yeah, I think I think so. You're you're going good? in and out a little okay. bit, but I think so. Okay. Um, There's this weird tendency of things that have been around a long time to like continue to stay. Um, mm -hmm. There's a sort of like uh, like filtering refinement thing. Um, I think Nassim Taleb calls it anti fragility. Um, and, um, and, and this was something that I was, I, I was always bothering me as I was reading Dune. I was like, no, like people would remember more than this. Right. Uh, and yes, I wanted, yes. Yeah. And, and so like a lot of my, uh, my, my sort of thesis in setting up the world building for this was to like, look at all the things that I thought Dune did wrong. Uh, and at the same time, like, I don't want to be one of those people who's like that book you love, it's bad. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, cause we do that a lot now. It's like, Oh, remember Luke Skywalker? He's terrible now. Uh, like we don't want to do that. Right. But there are things that could be, you know, said about Dune critically without, you know, you know, saying it's garbage or anything like that. I don't, I, I love Dune. It's, it's my number two science fiction novel, but, uh, well, what's number one? Book of the New Sun as a as okay. a collection, uh, yeah. I, I just I, I, Gene Wolfe is uh, a much better writer technically in terms of than skill Herbert, yeah. than Herbert is. Um, Herbert's strength is, I think, not in his in his style or or his like compositional powers. I think he's he's uh, he's much more uh, powerful when it comes to ideas and when it comes to like uh, it comes to the world building and and the the character, the dialogue, and sort of the the drama on on that front. Um, there's something's like wonderfully Elizabethan about Dune. It's like it, you can almost see it on stage as you're reading it. Uh, oh, you know, um, you you could totally play it with a with a chorus, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like the Baron is so a Malvolio, right? Like mm -hmm. turning to the audience and rubbing his hands, and yeah, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and uh, and and like that's so much fun. And and Wolf's a very different sort of writer, but Wolf doesn't waste, I think, a single word in in that whole series. Um, it's it's really something, but um. But no, so I I was thinking about this. I was and I was thinking about his attitude, his uh, of, of sort of cynicism uh, with regards to uh, like the great men of history, right? Um, you know, he he the the book is very much about, or really the series is about, you know, uh, great men are catastrophes. Like they're always bad news. Like you will get wrapped up in you know this charismatic leader's words. But Paul like isn't that guy. Like Paul is constantly trying not to be that guy. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that thesis is never very clear. Um, and his solution is weird. Um, can I, like, talk about, like, Dune spoilers? Uh, is that cool? Or I, I think Dune spoilers are okay. Yeah. I mean, like that's his, been out for a good minute. 
Yeah, his solution to the problem of like charismatic leaders becoming tyrants is hold on, like, why don't I become an immortal worm god and rule humanity for 4,000 years so they develop a genetic memory of oppression so that it never happens never again? Never happens again. Like, yeah. That's not a serious answer, right? It's a cool answer. I think God Emperor yeah. is the best book in the series, but like, that's not a serious treatment of the problem, right? And because you're not getting rid of your Cromwells, your Napoleons, like, that, that's an. It's an insoluble part of human society. Like they, they do show up. I know it's popular, yeah. you know, in modern historiography to like diminish individual agency in favor of like climate and like disease and stuff. And like, those are totally relevant factors, but like the personal character of Alexander is totally relevant. Uh, you know, like if you didn't have that guy in that place, you would not have had the Hellenistic world. Like it just would not have happened. And yeah. so I wanted to, take Frank's criticisms under advisement, right? I don't want to just write John Carter again, but I don't want to write Paul Atreides either. I want to I want to write a sort of, not a subversion, but a reversion of the heroic type, right? Uh, in a world after Dune. But I wanted people to think about Dune while doing it. So we needed to look like Dune. And then while I was at it, I figured, hey, like, why don't we address this whole history thing and these other right. problems? That was like very specifically something I was, I was thinking about. So it's really- Well, I, it, it, it read so- that, so amazing to me. And I, I want to talk about one specific part of it, and that is the <clears throat> myth legend that has survived of Sid Arthur uh, <laughs> that, that Hadrian reminisces about now and again um, and, and, and thinks of. And I, and I was struck by how much. Uh, and, and I and, and I'm, I'm assuming this is an amalgamation over time of like Sid Arthur's journey to transcendent and arthurian legend somehow you know just yeah yeah, story yeah it started mad. as a really dumb pun but the more i thought about it the more i liked it uh, yes i love it i absolutely love it and then how much of hadrian's journey actually mirrors siddhartha's journey i mean i'm sure that was all purposeful on your part yeah that came in that came in during the revisions my uh my editor uh <laughs> i don't know if i should say this uh but it's okay uh, my editor uh, was like, this book is great, uh, but we like really think, I, I really think that we can make you our like science fiction name of the wind. Uh, you should like, you should make the plot a little bit more like that in a couple of ways. So, like, why don't the original book, he was a, uh, he was a chattel slave in the middle. Um, and like, why don't you just like have me homeless for a bit? Uh, and I was like, okay, yeah, we can do that. And I, I was thinking about how I could like elevate that. And the whole Sid Arthur thing came out of there in the middle. Cause there's, uh, I'd always planned on this sort of through line with the Arthur comparisons, um, as I, right. I'm a I'm a big Arthur nut, uh, and uh, this was a nice way to sort of complicate that plot. And there is, it's kind of muted because of the translation aspects of the story, but there's a lot of sort of Indian cultural influence on on the world as well. The Salan Empire is supposed uh, to broadly be descended from. Uh, Europeans and, and Indian colonists who survived the uh, sort of ancient war that set the empire up in the first place. And uh, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, sort of like uh, Hindu aesthetics to like how the Chantry's religion operates. Uh, for example, they'll, they'll do like the, the food sacrifices and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, which I can never remember the, the, the Sanskrit name for, or um, uh, not a language uh, guy, as I said. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but uh, Anyway, um, so so that sort of grew out of that, but it, it started out as like a silly year of our Ford kind of pun, right? You know, like like in like in Huxley, right? And the more I thought about it, I'm like, oh, actually, like there are a lot of weird little uh, sort of narrative resonances between the Buddha story and and the Arthur story that would like you could totally conceivably uh, you could totally see somebody realizing this and being like well, Arthur might have been a bodhisattva, right? And maybe, like, we should, like, spin off a, a sort of sect of Buddhism on, on this basis. Um, you know, I, it's something that made me very nervous, though, because uh, the, I, I am frequently irritated by the depiction of my religion in, in uh, popular culture. Uh, we're, like, frequently uh, a punching bag and a boogeyman. Uh, you know, even like I love Stargate, but like the Ori are just evil space Catholics, right? And like sure. by people yeah. who don't understand, who don't understand Catholicism at all. Uh, not that I, I actually kind of weirdly like those seasons, but uh, it's hard to not like Ben Browder and Claudia Black. Uh, yeah. you know, but uh, but I digress. Uh, so I I uh, I've been very nervous to sort of really focus in on the Sid Arthurian thing because I don't want 
uh, Buddhists to think I'm taking the piss or something like that. Oh um, yeah, no, you I, know, you know, I, I found it, I found it really fascinating because I, I did in the world building see, okay, well, here's the, the, the two cultures. Of course, these myths would become amalgamated, and somebody, and and, uh, and someone like Hadrian that sees himself from the aristocracy that sees himself in a vaunted light a lot of the time. You know, why would he not? envision himself following in in the footsteps of of great heroes that, of, that came before him i i just totally dug it man I, I thought it was completely again one of those connective tissue ties back to the myths and legends that actually have formed us uh, reflected to us in this in this world that made me connect to the world even more so yeah well there's this um there's this thing tim powers uh fantasy writer says right because he, he does what he calls secret histories he'll write uh he'll get real into like uh the romantics or something right and he'll mm -hmm. read everything he can about byron and the shelleys and then right. he'll uh he'll start to notice like a bunch of weird stuff right like they all die you know weird coincidences he's like clearly it's vampires and then like right. writes a vampire and then right? then we'll get the stress of her regard yeah right which is which is so good uh yeah. but uh he you know when when people interview him about this they'll be like this is set in a fantasy world where you know the romantics like deal with vampires like no 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 it's our world and there are vampires right like in the same uh, and i just i love his insistence on this point because he i've seen him do it multiple times in interviews um I, i'm a big tim powers fan yeah. and um and this is like our future now in science fiction like it's sort of assumed that it's our future but in a lot of ways right like uh you know like unless it's star wars right uh, but in a lot of ways, I think that uh, I think people try to get away from it. Like Star Trek doesn't feel like our future uh, in a lot of ways to me. It, it feels like a, a fantasy land in which human emotions are like only 20 percent as strong. Uh, yeah. uh, I, uh, uh, I I made this point before. So if people have heard me, you know, I do my Star Trek rant, I won't. Um, but um, but it, it, it's strange. It, 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 you know, none of that stuff matters anymore. You know, every time Q shows up and like chastises Picard for the 18th century, he's like, that's not us. I'm like, well, like, you know, but yeah, but it is actually. You're um, still quoting Shakespeare. How can that yeah. not be us? Yeah, it's 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 so confusing to me. Uh, and uh, so I I, uh, I I wanted to sort of keep I, I wanted to sort of keep focus on, on that fact that it is it is our future and I want it to plausibly feel like our future. Right. But it's a future that's got space vampires and like a whole civilization that thinks it's the Roman Empire, because like every civilization is thought it's the Roman Everyone Empire. Everyone does. Like we every, do yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, you know, like, have you been to D.C.? Uh, well, you know. I, you know what? I was struck the other day and I was, I don't know, I was in some internet rabbit hole or something. And it's like, you know, all guys, all men think about the Roman oh, Empire yeah, sure. every so many days. It's like, it's because we're living in, I mean, it's, it's everything cyclical. Yeah, there's uh there's this meme uh and uh it's it, it's from this old I think it's an education video where like a, a kid is uh in class and he's pointing at the at the master's teachers like where's Brazil and he touches Brazil right where's China over here it's like where's the Roman Empire and he touches his heart right it's <laughs> <laughs> you know it's 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 sort it, it 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 is like that there's a, a a joke uh I saw once online uh where uh it's like as a, as as a boy at age 10, you are like assigned World War II or the Roman Empire. And like, that's that's you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. and I, I got assigned Roman Empire, uh, you know, pretty, pretty early. Uh, but, uh, you know, like you all know the World War II guy. He's out there. Oh. Uh, you know, so I have I have a, a, another theory. And you could you feel free to tell me how wrong I am. Okay. But OK. The 18 to 22 year old guy that wrote this and is shopping this. Right. I have, and I remember when I was 18 years old, it was a long time ago, but I was not that guy. That guy that wrote this and is shopping this is generally the smartest cat in the room a lot of the time, right? <laughs> like, I, it just is. It just is. So when I'm reading Hadrian Marlowe's journey, um, no doubt he's the smartest cat in the room a lot of times. Like, he, he, sees, he sees the problems with his society. He's able to see through the veneer of what they're trying to put in front of him and saying, don't look behind the curtain. Like he's the smartest cat in the room. So how much of an avatar is Hadrian Marlowe for Christopher Rocchio as you're coming into your own as a young man, getting through the world, maybe going on your own spiritual uh, uh, quests and, and, and questions, seeing the world as it is, as you, as you come into manhood, how, how much of there is a parallel? 
So it's a really hard question for me to answer. I, uh, I, I think the answer is less and less. I think that, you know, I, 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 I'm in a, I'm a, you know, I'm 30 now. I'm in a very different place than where Hadrian is at, you know, 600. Uh, and so I, I think, I think things have diverged, but I, I did sort of grow up trying to create this character. Right. And so, you know, in a weird way, I don't know that it's so much like he, like is a self insert in the way that so many writers do. I, but I, I do think that like, in a sense, we grew up together uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, and he's sort of gone his own way, uh, you know, as he's needed to become a, a much different person than I, than I am. Um, but I do think, I think the way that it's, that sort of most, uh, most tellingly or, or most relevant uh, is that between writing that first draft and uh, the final coming out, editing and everything, um, I stopped being an atheist. Uh, I'd been an atheist for uh, like 12 years, you know. After uh, growing up Catholic? Well, I, yeah, I was Catholic. Uh, I am Catholic. I mean, I've been Catholic the whole time. Technically, you can never stop being Catholic. But, right. uh, but I, you know, I was I was born Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I um, I had a really, I had a really hard time in high school. Um, a lot of my family died like all at once of unrelated. Oh my losses. God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Um, you know, it wasn't like, there wasn't a, like a murder or anything. It just like, I, I lost all my grandparents in a year. Oh, wow. uh, of like completely unrelated causes. Uh, my grandmother, who I was closest with, died on my birthday. Uh, oh, and God. Um, my grandfather and, uh, died on my birthday. Yeah, uh, and yeah, he man. he was uh, my my grandparents lived across the street from me on my all my life growing up. I mean, they they half more than halfway raised me. So, yeah, no, it's same. They were yeah. like ten minutes away. I um, yeah yeah I yeah um, went grocery shopping that morning. Uh, you know, I was expecting to go see her. She missed my birthday party the day before uh because she was sick and uh that was it and um so that was really hard to deal with and so i had i sort of like gave up on the religious thing going to public school did not help Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. you know because then you uh culture shock is so much right and i went from like a class of 40 to a class of 800 and and, like it was it was a difficult time and um you know um and and around the time that the book was 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 wrapping up, that started to change. And um, and so I think that like the distance between the kid Hadrian that the story is about and the narrator Hadrian who was telling the story is a consequence of the pretty serious things that happened to me, uh, like mostly good serious as uh, as I was doing those edits. Right, I uh, I was I was finishing school. I like was becoming a grown up. I. Uh, I met my, I met my wife. We weren't married yet, but I met her. Um, and, and she was a really big factor in sort of that personal change and stuff. And, um, sure. and, uh, she wasn't Catholic either, but she, she converted, uh, during this whole thing, nothing to do with me. And that was a, that was a pretty, uh, major sort of gravitational pull thing that happened. And, um, and so I like, I was stuck, I was stuck with this. I was stuck with the aura, right? I was stuck with the chantry. <laughs> And I was like, what have I done? I need to like fix, this is so dumb. Uh, like this is the, this is such a hackneyed bit of world building. Um, and I had to find a way to like not throw the book out. So I had to, in doing this revision, uh, grapple with the fact that like 18 year old Hadrian uh, and 1500 year old Hadrian like aren't the same person in a way that I think wasn't there in the original draft. Mm. Um, because I had done you know, a lot of growing up in the year or so between the selling of that first draft and the, and the revision. Um, it was a really, it was a busy year. And so I think like that was also in a weird way where like, you know, like, you know, Hadrian went off to college and I like, I went my own way too. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I think, cause I, I think since then, like he's not been really me at all. Um, mm. you know, I, I am not nearly, uh, I am about as dramatic, but I'm not as as sort of I, I don't want to say vindictive. I hate to criticize him because he's my main character. Uh, but uh, but I, I don't I don't have some of his personality traits, let's say. And uh, I, I do have some other ones. Um, yeah. And I have I have worse hair. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Pat, you know, it's 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 so there was a point in time maybe when you were writing it that you were closer. Yeah. And now you're becoming closer to the older wiser narrator hadrian that's well, that's really, really fascinating to me yeah I, I i think that's probably about right it's something that it's sort of a weird thing to think about because i really strongly like don't want my characters to be me um this is yeah. another opinion that i have about about a lot of writers is that they do this a lot 
Yeah. Uh, and um, it, it it gets weird. The, the, the best thing one of my readers has ever said to me is, my favorite thing about you as a writer, Christopher, is that I have been, after five books, completely unable to figure out what your gross sexual fetishes are. Uh, and, <laughs> and like, there <laughs> there are so many writers uh, where you're reading, you're like, yep. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I got it. I got gotcha. you. Uh, and yeah. and and that's like just one example, right? Like, you know, people will sit down and be like, "Am I reading your Facebook page?" Like, I do not need to know your thoughts about current events, right? Like, I thought I I thought I was reading a science fiction novel. Yeah. And um, you know, I read those to not look at Facebook. So uh, if you could cut that out. Um, let me let me. Know. It's interesting when you talk about the difference between the framing device of the narrative and and the the current journey of Hadrian in, in the book. And I, I, this, it completely, this device worked for me and it's so often that it doesn't work for me. And the only author I see use it over and over and over again is Stephen King. And that's like, it's foreshadowing on steroids. It's like foreshadow, it's overt foreshadow where it's the yeah, narrator is yeah. actually telling you like, this shit's going to go horribly wrong. You know, like, I mean, there, there's, there's, no guesswork at all. You know, King does it a lot. You do it a bit. And when you do it, you it's so many people piss me off, but I totally bought it in this scenario because of the distance of years and wisdom from the narrator to what's being played out uh, in the timeline as, as Hadrian is a younger man. I, I think that I think that's the necessary component, right? Because if you can do that, then you're not uh, you're not dealing with so much a four dimensional story anymore. Right. You know, people moving in space time. Uh, but you've got like an extra time dimension, right? right. Uh, and I think that if you can do that and you can use it dramatically in a meaningful way uh, and not just to, you know, M. Night Shyamalan, your reader, I, I, I think that I, th I think that you can get a lot out of it because it changes the kind of the, the kind of story that you're telling, right? And there is something that I think isn't going to be obvious until the series is done that like I've been I've been hyped. Right. Like mm -hmm. there's there's a there's an aspect from the storytelling that's just not come through yet. And partially that's just because it can't yet, because it sort of deals with last act of the series kind of stuff. But um, but there's like stuff that's that, that's missing. This is something Gene Wolfe does like like so well. Right. You have, you know, characters writing who like aren't the characters they claim to be at all. Or, you know, they, they lose their memory in weird ways. So they're like, you know, whole chapters missing and thing. Right. Like he he's like very cognizant of the text as artifact in a way that a lot of writers aren't. And I got really interested in the medium uh, as part of the story. There was, a, I used to be a big Doctor Who fan mm -hmm. and um, I used to listen to the big Finnish radio dramas all the time. Uh, and there's one called a natural history of fear uh, that is about uh, the eighth doctor uh, trying to, to, to save this sort of dystopian like city from itself. Right. And, um, it turns out, I'm just going to spoil it. Cause like, it's kind of obscure. It's fine. Uh, it turns out that the doctor is not in the story at all. None of the characters that you're listening to, right. Are the characters that they sound like it's all a bunch of robots that have been programmed to be the characters to save the city long after the doctor has escaped from this, uh, this dystopian nightmare. Right. Um, and you can't see them to know that they're robots because it's a radio drama, right? Mm, and so mm -hmm. it takes advantage of the fact that that dimension of the story is gone, right, to mess with you. And that was like, it was literally like a little mic drop thing right at the end. I was like, oh, this is so genius, right? And uh, and ever since I've been really interested in things that do this, right? Like video games that like make the brightness adjustment part of the storytelling because you're like adjusting the optics on your helmet or whatever, right? Um, you know, games that find a way to get the dying and respawning thing to make sense in the story, make that part of the game, right? Like that stuff's really cool. Now, text are a lot more limited because the conventions of what constitutes a novel, right, as an object in space are so set, right? Like if you mess with that too much, people are like, I am not reading this. Yeah, right? I'm like, confused. I, yeah. Right. Like I like my friend showed me House of Leaves once. I'm like, oh, this is really fascinating. But like, I don't even know how to read it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I felt the same. It's like there's a story somewhere in here that you that you hid from your reader. Yeah, and it's it's cool, right? But like that was I think that was too far. But you can do stuff with the medium still, right? And and so one of the things I used to I used to hate first person, like as a kid. I was like, I am not on a spaceship. You, the author, are lying to me. Uh this bothers me. But I got over that. Uh I think when I read Neil Stevenson's Anathem, maybe, or maybe I read the there's a YA series. Yeah, it was, it was the YA series, uh Pendragon, DJ McHale was all mm. was all first person. It's it's pretty good. It's pretty good. But it it used the framing device and the textual nature of 
uh, how the characters were getting the stories as part of it. And like, that was fun. Uh, and that, and I started to sort of figure that out. Um, but um, when you write first person, you actually like everything is character, right? Actually. Sure. Right. Sure. If Adrian yeah. is going to tell you for three paragraphs about, I don't know, Blaise Pascal, then that's because he's a nerd. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, and like, that's useful. That's, that's good information for your, your, your people you know, your readers to have. And so that was, that was really good that way too. Right. If I make a mistake, if eye color changes, that's Hadrian's fault. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's not me. I don't have to fix that actually shut up. Um, you know, and so I, uh, like I was really attracted to that aspect of, uh, uh, of the format as well. And, um, I don't remember why I started on this train. I'm really sorry. Uh, no, it's, it's all good. Normal, normal me behavior, but, um, <laughs> I just get going and like, how did I, where was I coming from? Yeah. Um, but um, it was the it was the framing the narrative framing device and, oh, and yeah. overt sure. uh, foreshadowing. Yeah, um, yeah, and and so doing that, you take like you take certain questions off the table, like what is going to happen, which you don't completely take off the table, right? I I remember the first book came out, people were like we know how it ends, and like you don't though, no, like, you're, no, like no, you don't, liar. you don't. Uh, you know, people say silly things like, oh, you can't kill the point of view character because it's we because he's writing it, and like it's science fiction. I can maybe do whatever I want actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, don't tell me what to do. Uh, you know, yeah. and um, you know, so uh, you know, you, you change the questions, right? You you make the story less about turning the next page and more about what's happening in the moment and why and how. And I think in cases like things are about to go really badly, the question then becomes about the tragedy of that moment, right? And emotionally how that feels and how that impacts people. And if you can you can write the tragedy, right? And not the shock, like those, that's a different, that's a different, that's a different story. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, I think, I think when you do this, you make a, a story that's more rereadable. And I think a good book needs to be good the third time. And the 33rd time, if your book's only good once, it's bad. Um, and, uh, you know, like a lot of books are only good once and they're meant to be only good once. And that's fine. But that's, yeah. you know, that's not what I'm writing. You know, I want to write something that's more calorie dense, I guess. Um, sure, sure. So let, let me let me ask you this because you bring up emotionality here, and and I I really want to touch base on that. I thought, and I truly am, and listening to your study of the of of the Greeks performance and the Shakespeare and everything, and I I think you've got a background of of why of how this basically touched me the emotionality of it. I found like really, and maybe this is just because the way I was reading it again, um, but. For me, there was some really wide swings of emotionality. We have uh, on Hadrian's journey, um, and I don't want to give anything away, but there's there's tragedies early on of 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 figure that's very important to father figure that's very important to him. Then moving on when he gets to to the next planet and uh, like his first love, there's tragedies galore. Some I felt a real visceral emotional attachment to. Some I felt like that as he's going through this journey, somewhat mirroring the spiritual journey of Siddhartha for me, like he's seeing the ills of society, uh, the stratas of society of have and have nots and how we take care of the sick and all these kind of things. So I was, I, I wasn't connected to them as a person. I was more connected to them as a placeholder for his journey of what's around him and how he's going to fit into it. But juxtapose that with, I was, very, very emotionally shook early on from tragedies that happened. So there was like a real swing for me. So when I started looking at it, it's like, wow, I, I've gone from complete emotional involvement, like watching a, some, a modern performance to almost watching something like a Brechtian performance that's completely representational I'm supposed to be learning from. Was was that a cognizant choice from you, or that's just me bringing my background to the to when I read the book? I I don't know. Like cognizant choice is how I would put it. I think it's an inevitable consequence of the format. I think that um, obviously, like there are some bits where you like you you know it's going to hit harder, and you have the space, right? Like the the Gibson stuff at the beginning, like that's that's very important. That's also like more important to Hadrian, right? That's yeah. not to diminish the importance of like the other events, right? But if you like, you know, you think about it, he's lived for a thousand plus years, right? Like, you know, maybe, right, something like Cap doesn't sting as much a thousand years later, right? But like, you know, you think about like your own 
I don't know, romantic history, right? Like maybe that first one is the one that really like bothers you still in some way, right? You know, you did something wrong. You missed an opportunity, right? Something like that. But maybe it's the third one. Maybe the first one, like you parted amicably, right? Yeah. You don't even yeah. think about the first one. Anymore, or you don't even right? remember. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Like, um, or, you know, it's, it's that way with like tragedies too, right? Like maybe, you know, like my grandmother's death affected me like really profoundly, but like, you know, maybe there was another, you know, another relative that didn't, right? Or like, you know, there was like your, like, a, like someone else, you know, like that didn't really get to you in some way. And, um, and like, I think that's partially just the nature of human experience, but I also think it's partly like not everything in a novel can hit at a, at eight, right? Not everything can hit at 10. Some things have to hit at four uh, because otherwise it starts to feel funky. And, and right. I, I've also noticed, right? Like, cause I, uh, I, I, I've been like pretty involved in talking to my readers over the last few years. And that's something that's getting harder and harder to do. Uh, but like, I'll see them are just in terms of scale, right? Like they're just getting to be more of them, which is awesome, but it makes it harder to talk to everybody. You know, I, I increase, like I had to, I just stopped my, my Q and a uh, live stream last month, like without answering every question for the first time, which was, that was new. Uh, yeah, right. That's, so that's great we, though. It's, it's really encouraging. Yeah. But like, it's strange. And, um, but like you see them, uh, when, when I said like, you know, like it, it's getting to be too much, right. I just, I didn't mean like, because they're annoying or something like that. I just mean like, there's a lot, a lot of them. Yeah. Like uh, literally and, too uh, many. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just want to be clear. I wasn't like, you know, being mean, but, um, but, uh, sheesh. Um, uh, what was I saying? I, uh, I lost it. Let, let me, let me, let me throw this. Was there, because I found a lot of, and I love this in books, especially of, of this, of the genre and other genres that kind of like it, that there, there's a distance from reality that allows me to see a social mirror of the world that I'm trying to find my way in. And I, I, I guess I'm sure you meant for that. And that for me, maybe gave me some at four and some at eight, the way you're describing like, yeah, that, I'm sure I, that was purposeful. Yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, like, like characters are not just themselves, right? They're not just people, right? They are icons of all sorts of things. Right. So like, uh, you know, like cat isn't just cat, like you say, right. She is, she is the, you know, the, the, the surf class on Emesh, right. Or the surf class mm -hmm. generally. Um, you know, she, she has a very different experience of life in the galaxy than Hadrian does. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, so too, right? Like, you know, I, I joke sometimes, right? There's actually only one character in the series, right? There's only Hadrian, right? Everybody else is. And I totally get that. Like, I totally get that. Like, Cat is a moment for Hadrian to become Hadrian, for, for him to get further on this journey of realizing every individual is precious. I mean, that it's that moment. It's that moment for hey, Hadrian. Yeah, I feel it, it more it, for Hadrian than I do for the, a tragedy of anyone around him at times. Other times, it's it, like you say, it's at eight easily. Yeah. And he also like he doesn't understand people always all the time either. Right. So the characters we're meeting are his sort of icon of that person. Right. Um, and, and so often like we do this all the time and it sounds bad, but we, we do like in order just to operate in the world, you can't like look at every human you meet right uh as like this you know 10 dimensional like deeply complex character right some person some people are just like you know the person on the on the other end of the retail call right uh the cashier right um the person who's yelling at me on the internet for no reason right whatever right uh and hadrian does this and uh sometimes doesn't know he's doing it you know he tries to understand people and fails uh, his understanding of his brother for example is insufficient um you know, um, so there's that element to it as well. Uh, it's, it's just the fact that we're, we're looking at this world through Hadrian's keyhole and, mm -hmm. you know, he's not, he's not perfect. And, um, I think that gives you uh, a lot of opportunities as a writer, right. To texture the world in, in a very particular way. Right. Cause you're, you're, cause you have this extra lens, right. Of this person, as opposed to trying to be objective. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, um, but and it, it makes him so real. Because yeah. that's that's real. Right. But it also, yeah, it also turns all the other characters into opportunities to make the main character more interesting. Because the main character is almost never anybody's favorite character, right? You know, like everybody's like Luke Skywalker, Han Solo is my guy, right? Yeah. I was never that guy. Yeah. I wanted the laser sword, but uh yeah. <laughs> uh, between that and the psychic powers, I don't know, like Han Solo is pretty cool, yeah. but uh yeah, but I want to push people off. 
Um, yeah, I, know, I wanted to be the Jedi myself, so I, I totally get it. Yeah, but 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 if you if you have this opportunity to like really really get to know somebody, right? Like you do, like I like you know I do with Hadrian. Um, then you have more of a chance to make that someone's favorite character. Um, you know, still, you know, often people be like, yeah, you know, like you know, number three over here, like that's my guy, and that's fine. But um, but I I really wanted it to be, you know, with 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 Batman films, for example, like it's never really about Batman, right? Especially like the Nolan films were really bad about this. Batman is like he's like the number two, number three character on screen at any given moment. Like he really shouldn't be. He's a he's a dude who dresses like a bat. Like that, like I like I want to know about that, right? Like yeah, that's that's fairly interesting. Yeah. It's it's actually pretty cool. And I don't know that it's more interesting than the clown. Like actually. Uh yeah. like we talk we talk about the bat fleas. And so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to tell a story that was about the guy, right? It wasn't about everything else, it's about it's about him because he is, I mean, he is he is a Napoleon, right? He is an Alexander. Uh, you know, he's he's got he has this impact, right? Uh on on history and yeah. he is is sitting down to tell you about it and it's not uh you know it's not what any it's, it's not what you think going in right um he doesn't he hasn't done exactly what you think is going to happen and the consequences haven't been exactly what you've been told right and and he needs to tell you the real story because it's even weirder than you think yeah um and it's gotten frankly weirder than i thought it was going to be uh, when I started, like, I mean, that's awesome. When your characters uh, like surprise you, that has to be, that's gotta be the greatest, right? Yeah. It's great. Cause everybody again is like, Oh, I know how this ends. Like, man, I don't a hundred percent. No, you, you, you're wrong. Uh, you know, um, uh, in that line. And again, this is just me totally guessing from having read one book and talked to you for a little bit. Like I'm guessing what you did here with this book of him starting out on this journey right leaving his aristocracy finding himself you know i'm guessing there's a totally different vibe for, to the next book i'm guessing you do try and do something different with each one of these books yeah yeah with the weird exception of like four and five because they were written as one book i think those kind of feel those kind of feel the same but yeah i especially uh, uh no look it's still ongoing but like with that one exception i i've always sort of thought about each book as having sort of its own kind of genre grace notes. I don't like using the word genre for things like cyberpunk or uh, like something as specific as gothic horror or, yeah. or thriller. I think those are, I don't think those are genres. I, I, I like hold to like an older sort of uh, model of literary theory where like the novel is itself a genre, right? Um, or like maybe adventure or biography. I think the genre of these books is biography, but um you know, uh, memoir, I guess, but, yeah, um, sure. but like, you know, it, it's too late. I lost, I lost the, the vocabulary battle. Like we call these genres, uh, book two is like a lot more Gothic. It's a lot more cyberpunk. Uh, book three is a lot more an adventure novel. It's a lot more, uh, political thriller. Uh, book four has got some dystopia. It's got some horror in it. Um, book five too. Book five is kind of a war book, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, and so I, I did set out to sort of distinguish the identity of each of these books in a lot of ways because there's also big time jumps between them, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we're covering a thousand plus years of history. Granted, he's not awake for all of it, right? But uh, like, of course, there are time jumps. I can't document every second. Um, and, um, and 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 so he's in a different place. He's kind of a different guy. I think uh, I think of character Hadrian in each book as uh, as a different character really each time, right? Wow. Um, Cause there's, there's so much space. Cause like you aren't who you were when you were 20 or who you oh were. Oh my God. No, like, I can't even, I, I can't even remember that guy, Christopher at this point. Yeah. And you, you know, you, you can't in a certain sense be held accountable for him either. Right. And uh, <laughs> I, God, I and, hope not. Thank God we didn't record everything back then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's um, and, and this is, this is, you know, sort of part of the philosophy with making this character specifically uh, the other characters haven't really required uh, that kind of like, you know, like high, you know, megapixel attention um, just because they, you know, they're at more of a, a remove. Um, although even that's not to say the other characters don't like grow and stuff, but like the, the, the depth of attention. Uh, I, I, I don't have to usually think about like Polino or somebody as a new guy each book. Um, right. You yeah. know, just because. But I, I mean, by, by the end of this, and again, you know, I'm not giving anything away, but by the end of it, the, there's, there's a bit of a, uh, 
I mean, the universe, a big place. We get some Lovecraftian dread in here. We get like a found family kind of coming together. And it's like, I could say like book two is going to have a totally different vibe, man. I cannot wait to see what happens in book two. Yeah. Oh, I really hope you like it. Book two, I, I, I've said this before, book two is my is my favorite child, except for my real child. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> Book two, uh, I, it was the first book I wrote, like, wrote professionally, right? You know, that first book, you know, I, I shot for, for years and years and years and, like, rewrote and tried to get, you know, to work and, and, and stuff like that. But then after that, you know, uh, you're expected, you know, there are a couple exceptions in the industry to, to write, you know, a book you know, to a schedule. And, um, you know, so they were like, Oh, when can you have book two, like you have it in the next 12 months. And I was like, Oh, I guess I should figure out how to do that. You know? So I had to like learn to outline and stuff like that. So I actually finished, I finished book two before book one came out, uh, oh, wow. which is a, a feat I have since failed to replicate, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, but, um, but I, I learned to outline doing that. And I, it's the book where I felt like I made the most growth as a writer. Uh, between you know the previous book and, and that one um and it was such a like straightforward pleasant writing experience because like i didn't have like any weird stuff like blow up and take me away from work for a couple weeks or a chapter that took three months to write <clears throat> book six um <laughs> or um or some crazy thing like that happened uh you know and so uh, book two i'm really fond of uh everybody says uh that i peaked in 2020 the book three is my best one i'm really hoping with book six i can make them eat those words because i'm tired of hearing it yeah yeah uh, i they, dude i hear uh demon and white everyone said brings up demon and white it's why you get to demon and white it's like I, I can't wait to get to howling dark man yeah, i can't I, I can't wait to do lesser devil because i'm i'm interested in crispin yeah, Lesser Devil was a weird one. I uh, wrote it basically in like two weeks. Um, I, I went to Worldcon in 2018 and they didn't panel me. So I didn't have to be at the convention at all. I just, and like, what am I going to do? Like sit in the lobby? So I, I just like went back to my friend's house and just sat by the I'll, pool and started. I'll write a novella. Yeah. I'll show you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I I know book six comes out 2024. I know yeah, you're, you're actively working on seven. So I, this the last question of the night, my brother. Yeah. Have you got flashes? Have you got glimmers of what is going to come up after Sun Eater has been completed? Absolutely, yeah. No, I, I, I I'm not suffering for like one of ideas. My real issue is I don't know which one to pick. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So I, I think I'm just going to feel it out. I'm going to finish seven. I think I'm going to do another novella after that because I've been promising a Balkan novella for years and it never materialized. Uh, so I think I'll do that next. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll see what I'm feeling. Cause I've got like, uh, I got a couple ideas. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to say too much. I don't ever intend to leave the setting though. Uh, I, I will always come back to it. Even if I go do a fantasy thing or something like that, I'll come back. If I can write a science fiction novel and put it in this universe, I will. So, okay. All um, right. So you, so you still may be in the neighborhood even after the, even after Adrian's story is done. Yeah. You know, you do so much work on world building. It seems uh, like a shame to throw it away just to write another space opera, you know? Sure. So yeah. I, uh, you know, if it'll, if it'll fit here, it will. And there's even, there's even another big series in the setting I, I think I could do. So w one day I won't do that next. I need a break, but yeah. uh, these big series are hard, uh, you know, sort of business uh, propositions. So I, I can, I, I can only imagine. Well, Christopher, I want to thank you absolutely so much for spending the time with me for being so amazingly open uh, and, and willing to, to talk about anything I threw at you. You have been a true, true gentleman. And I am a, I, as much a fan as I am of this first book. And like I say, I had to set it down just to let the wheel spin a time or two. I'm even more of a fan of your artistic journey and where you started as a young man. And I, I just can't wait to keep tracking it as you grow and move forward. Yeah, well, thanks, man. This has been an absolute pleasure. I, I really appreciate you having me on, and I, I was really so humbled by uh, by the review. It was really, it was really something. I, you know, I wanted to sort of, you know, uh, move in the direction of Frank Herbert and stuff like that. It's always weird to me to hear people, you know, say that I've I've done even, you know, ten percent of something like that. So. Oh, uh, dude, you're, yeah. you're, you're higher than 10, my friend, even with book one, you're higher than 10. And for me, it's like, if you're here at 18 to 22, like I can't, I can't imagine where you're going to go. Yeah. Well, I hope it's somewhere good. You know, we'll see. 
Uh, I have to stick to landing. If book seven is bad, then I may as well throw the rest of them away. So uh, I, I think I think you're on house money there. I'm pretty sure you're going to stick it. I mean, I, I'm I'm just listening from people that are way further than me, but it won't take me long to get much further. But I want to thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. It has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Again, thanks for having me. It's been uh, it's been blessed.